You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. last church of the seven churches of Revelation this morning. Revelation chapter 3, looking at verses 14 to 22. The title of today's message is Self or Savior. I have a love-hate relationship with Home Depot. (laughs) I am often inspired when I go into Home Depot and uh, I see all the the nails and screws and wood and all the opportunity and something and the heart of a man just swells up with pride. But then I'm often reminded of my gross inability to do anything in the, uh, uh, with my hands whatsoever. I also am reminded of how many times I've been in Home Depot doing something for my wife that I'd rather be watching football. And they have a, a saying at Home Depot, right? You can do it. We can help. Emphasis on the help uh, in my case, right? You can do it. We can help. There's a lot of believers that live their life that way. They are the Home Depot do-it-yourself believers. And they say, hey man, we can do it. And God can help. Well, can I just reword that a little bit? And I think it has a better understanding of what the Christian spiritual walk really should be. He can do it. And we can help. (laughs) That God has a great grand plan and he allows us to partake in he has given us the power and the ability to do so but only by his strength and power he can do it we can help to the church at laodicea struggled with self-reliance and wishy-washy faith they struggled with wanting to do things in their own strength and their own power And they have struggled with doing right and doing wrong. They wanted to stay right in the middle ground. Our church can relate to that. Modern churches can relate to that. Wanting to do things in our own power. Struggling to take the right stand from time to time. This letter written long ago is relevant for us today. I hope that you learn from this message, brothers and sisters, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. So look with me in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and open the door. I will come in with him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Well, this is the prayer of Jesus that he has offered to his seven churches. He who has an ear, the Spirit says, let him hear. So God, I pray that you would let us hear what you want us to hear. Lord, I pray that you would help me to decrease, Lord, and for you to increase. Lord, that you would give us supernatural understanding or supernatural obedience in this week and the weeks to come. We love you, and we ask you saying in Jesus' name, amen. So point number one we see is stop relying on yourself. We see this in verses 14 through 17. See, Laodicea was a wealthy city. It was a banking center. It was known for its exportation of black wool. And if you could actually keep it there, I know I, uh, this is different than what I said, but keep that picture there for just a second. And it was known for having its water piped in. The water in Laodicea was not good water, so they had aqueducts and pipes um, that, were, that were brought in to the city. Um, but it wasn't the clean, pure fresh water of some of the neighboring towns, and that'll be important later. We see Jesus, as he's done in all the other churches, he begins to give his credentials to the churches. So the words of the amen, which means the true and the faithful witness, the beginning of God's creation. And just so we're clear about this, uh, particularly in the state and the context which we live, uh, I know... Uh, many different uh, cults will abuse passages like this. And they'll say, remember, see, Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. He's created, and so he's like us. And, and that's the complete opposite of what the Bible teaches, and that's the complete opposite of what the Bible is teaching here. Jesus is being emphasized as the creator. He is the source. He is the origin. Jesus was not created. Jesus is the creator. And that's important to know for your uh, Mormon friends. Now, Jesus is the one who creates all, not the other way around. Look, we see in our passage here, he says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Hot means to be, have spiritual fervor, and cold means outright antagonism to the things of God. The Laodicea wasn't either one of those things. They were Christians claiming the name of Christ and yet living and relying solely on themselves. See, lukewarm has the idea of indifference, unusable, comfortable, complacent, and maybe even disinterested. Jesus, as he does with the, all the other churches, connects it to the, the, the cities and town, and so uh, and so the, the water that was brought in from the other towns, the uh, Colossae was beautiful, crisp waters, and, 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 and other towns nearby had beautiful hot springs. But in Laodicea, they had lukewarm, tepid, um, not very uh, appetizing water. It was hard to enjoy. This was how their faith was unenjoyable, unusable in a lot of ways. I don't know if you ever spent any time in Europe. I, I've got family in Sicily still, and so I've been there a, a couple of times. And and uh, and I'm the kind of guy, man, and I'm just a typical, prototypical American, right? So when I drink something, I have I I, I put all the the ice and that you can stack into the top of my glass, and then I put some little Coke in there with it, right? And then when I drink milk, I put my milk in the freezer, which drives my wife nuts because I like to have things just the way I like it. And so I, I put my, my milk in the freezer, man, because I like it to be nice and cold. But when you go to Europe and you say, hey, uh, can I get a little ice? First, they're going to look at you very rude. And, uh, and then they're going to bring over like two little minuscule cubes of ice and think that that's going to accomplish something. And so then you have to deal and, and you have to suck down all this lukewarm drink the whole time you're there it's unpalatable it's not enjoyable and christ is saying your faith this church has lukewarm faith it's not hot it's not cold it's unpalatable so much so he says that it makes me sick 
And we'll talk about that more in here in a second. But we see symptoms of a lukewarm heart in the, in the verses that follow. He says that you are poor. Um, the, this church supposed that it had such adequate material and resources that it could do without the Lord's spiritual help. If you'll remember, the Smyrna church thought itself what, poor, but Jesus said, you're not poor, you're actually rich. But the Laodiceans thought they were rich, but they were actually poor. He said that you're blind. They supposed themselves to have spiritual insight, but Jesus said they couldn't see themselves or the Lord properly. When the Scripture talks about seeing things, many times it's talking about truth and untruth. If you'll remember in the story of Samuel, there's the high priest Eli. And Eli is, is, is very old at this time, and his eyes are going blind. But the, uh, but the Scripture is pointing to a, a, a deeper issue that he has, that his heart, that his, that his spiritual sight is dimmed, and his sons are actually very rebellious, and they're doing wicked things in the temple, and he refuses to discipline them, because, but not because he can't physically see, but because his spiritual sight is darkened. So is the case here with the Laodiceans. He says that they were naked. They thought they were clothed with righteous character, but were spiritually pitiful. See, to be naked meant to be defeated and humiliated and helpless. They thought they were clothed, but they were naked. Y'all, uh, we've all read the story of the, uh, the emperor's new clothes. Anybody, y'all have read, read that one? Y'all with me? Okay. I'm raising my hand because I want you to raise your hand. I'm not, I'm not having a Tourette's or something, right? I want, I want you guys to, to make, make sure everybody's awake, all right? Uh, the emperor's new clothes, right? And you all remember the story, the, the emperor, some con men come in, and, and uh, they say, hey, we're going to make you these fine clothes that only the people who are, who are, uh, who are, are faithful to the position and uh, people who are smart are the ones that are going to be able to see it. And so the, the emperor buys it hook, line, and sinker, and they sew on this fake clothes, and, he, and they even put on these, this pretend outfit, and they act, and act like he's being dressed. And then we know that he walks down this parade, and, and everybody's afraid to say something. Everybody can see that the king is naked. And or the emperor is naked, but nobody wants to say it. Nobody wants to be thought of as, as dumb or stupid or, or, or not interested and in, in, in prepared for their positions until a little boy says, I, I think the kid's, king's naked. Out of, and out of the mouth of babes, right? And, and, and the king, whether he recognizes it or not, is walking in complete humiliation. That was the case with Laodicea. That they were... Uh, blessing themselves and telling themselves how great they were. And, and uh, they lived in a very rich city, and they had a lot of uh, physical blessings, and so that hindered um, God's power in their lives. And so they, were, they thought they were clothed in splendor, but they're actually walking in a parade naked and helpless. Like children, they believed they were self-sufficient when they were utterly dependent. Now, if you walk, now, most of the ones have, have walked off right now, and that's good. Because if you ask any one of these kids sitting on a front row on any day of the week, nine times out of ten, if you said, hey, are, are you little? Are you big? You know what they're going to say? I'm big. I'm not little. I'm big. Right? Are you big or are you little? She's big. Right? Now, that's a good thing for kids to, to believe that. But kids believe they're much more self-sufficient than they really are. They can't, do, they can't do anything. They don't take care of their housing. They don't take care of their plans. They don't take care of their nutrition. Those are all things that are taken care of by their parents. But they say, I'm big. I can take care of it. That's where the Laodiceans are. That's where self-sufficient believers are. are. They say, I'm big. I don't need you, God. And we think that we are standing clothed in splendor and can see things, but God is saying that you are helpless. Jesus says, so Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Literally means I will. Makes me want to vomit. 
Now, spit here is talking about judgment. We've read, remember, several times Jesus has brought accusation and criticism against the churches, and he said, he said repent of them, and I, and I won't come in judgment against this church. And he's saying the same thing here. Repent of your wishy-washiness, your self-reliance. See, this self-sufficient, delusional church had made Christ sick to his stomach, and he was giving them time to repent. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, make sure that you humble yourself and see what God has done in your life. A forgetful heart is often a disobedient heart. A heart that doesn't remember what God has brought them through, what God is currently giving them and blessing them with, is often a heart that is disobedient. It's not that God hasn't taken care of you, it's just that you and I don't remember sometimes. Make sure you humble yourself and see what God has done in your life. Stand when it makes you uncomfortable, unpopular, and unprofitable. Jesus, would you rather be hot or cold? And most particularly, he would want us hot, full of spiritual fervor and passion for gospel truth, not somewhere in the middle with this wishy-washy faith. I encourage your church to know and spend time in God's Word if you expect to be rooted in it. There's a lot of Christians that are very passionate about a God that they know very little about because they haven't spent time in God's Word. They didn't spend time knowing Him and in some intimate prayer. And so they're, they're passionate and they're standing, but they really don't know what they're standing on. That's good. I'm glad you got passion, but know the God that you love. And that'll keep you from wishy-washy faith. So point number one is stop relying on yourself. Point number two is start relying on the Savior. In verses 18 through 22, start relying on the Savior. You see, for every symptom of lukewarm self-sufficiency, Christ has a cure. Look at me in verse 18. Thy counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He talks about refined gold here. He's referring to righteous character that has been proven genuine through testing that has been made holy. nothing makes God's people examine their priorities faster than suffering and trials. And a believer that's gone through suffering, trials, tribulations, difficulties, and has relied on the Lord will come out with gold refined by fire. You will have character that makes you more and more like Christ the Son. He says, I will give you white garments so he said they were they were poor but christ says i will give you real gold he said that you guys were naked he said, but i will give you white garments in the book of revelation particularly you see white garments means covering your shame and your guilt uh, instead of having a lack of righteousness we stand pure and holy and secure before the lord Even though we've done wrong, although we've made a lot of mistakes, even though we've been self-reliant, he says, I will make you pure. You may not know it, but God is in the fashion. God has a lot to say about clothes in the book of Revelation. He says, I will put you in white garments. I will make you pure. He says, I will give salve to your eyes. To see as God sees, at least partly. We get to see with his wisdom, with his compassion, with his truth, with his providence, his plan. If we, if we want to, to see the way that, that God sees, then we have to see that he's in control of all things. And that he works things uh, for, for his good and for, for, for his glory. And so that doesn't always mean for my good and for, for my glory. And, and sometimes difficulties will, will come my way, but we're looking through the plans and purposes and the providence of God. We see things with compassion. There's, there's people that, that harm us and they hurt us and they're ugly to us. And, and if I see through normal eyes, I want to react 
in normal ways, in normal fleshly ways. But if we see the eyes of compassion, if we can see the way that God sees instead of being hurt, instead of reacting the way that we want to react, instead we can react the way that God does in love and mercy. To see is to see with wisdom. To see with God's truth. One of my favorite passages in Samuel says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God sees my heart. Aren't you? People can misunderstand and misinterpret, but God never does. And he never has. But God sees your heart. God knows who you really are. And so we worship him in sincerity. And so we, we ask for eyes that see the way that God sees. In verse 19, it says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. We see repentance and relationship go hand in hand. That God's not clobbering us over the head and, and this, this, this uh, warmonger just ready to bring the, the hammer down. He says, no, I want to bring uh, you to be disciplined because it's out of love. I, I want to have a love, right, wholesome relationship with you. And, and so that only happens through repentance of sin. Living and doing wrong purposely always uh, brings obstacles in our relationship with the Lord. And so repentance and relationship go hand in hand. You want to have a, a strong, healthy, vibrant relationship with the Lord, then there must be daily dying. There must be repentance of sin. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Now, I think this passage is, uh, is, is misused many times. Uh, many times the, the, the people use this as a, as a salvation version. Hey, hey, man, Jesus is on the outside of your heart knocking, and you should let him in. And, and maybe broadly speaking, that's okay. But this is written to a church with Christians. And where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in this passage? He's on the outside of the door. That's not a good place to be. If you're a church, the called out ones, the ones who are supposedly supposed to be lifting up the name of Jesus, and he's knocking on the door. Hey, can I come in? They were so concerned with their own powers and their own reliance that they didn't even know that Jesus wasn't there. But he says, let me in, and I'll use you. Verse 21, we see, the one who conquers, I will Grant with him, I will, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father. The Lord is enthroned, in control, in power. We can trust him and we can join him. That's what Jesus says. Isn't that cool? So for starters, if you're worried about self-reliance and giving things over to the Lord, Jesus says, let me tell you where I sit at. He said, I sit at the right hand of the Father. I stand in power. I stand in wisdom. I stand in control. And you can trust me. You don't have to rely on yourself. You can rely on me. I am completely trustworthy. And he says, then we can join him in that rule, in this life and in the life to come. So just a, a couple points of application, and we'll be done. See, we, we, we rely on the Savior by trusting his plans and his purposes. By trusting his plans and his purposes. I talk to a lot of people and they're not overly concerned about the Lord's plans and purposes. Well, where are you going to go to college? Well, he's here, here, and here. Have you prayed about it? You know what God wants you to do with your life and your career? You should ask him. He'll show you. Well, I, I want to do this. I want to have this type of marriage i want to live my life this way what does god say about it if you're doing something different than what god says you're going down a path that's going to bring suffering rely on the savior by giving control over daily daily i think that's why god said we must daily die 
daily take up your cross. He didn't say weekly because he knows the self-reliant heart of man. And it, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take more than a day. Sometimes it doesn't take more than an hour for me to say, God, I got this. And God says, no, every day, every day before you start out your day, declare your reliance on him. Ask God to fill you with his spirit as you yield to him, his plans, his purposes, the conversations he wants you to have. You yield control daily. We rely on the Savior by obeying without reservation. By obeying everything he tells us to do whenever he tells us to do it. You want God, you want to see God working powerfully in your life? Don't decide which things you'll obey and which things you won't. You want to see God bless in your life and, and, and see him uh, in a real and powerful way? Then whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to go, do it. Obey in every aspect of your life, the big things and the small things. Obey in every part of it. You'll see God working in your life in a way you've never seen it before. Give control of the, to the Lord of the things that, in your life that you care most about. People say, okay, well, you can have this and you can have that. But man, this is here. I'm going to do it my way. The careers go here. Family goes here. College goes here. Marriage goes here. And God's not allowed to touch those things. I'll handle those things. If you really want God to work in your life, and you give God control over the things that you care most about. I encourage you to lean on Christ, but also lean on his family that has given you. That's part of why God has given us this church, so that we can lean on each other in difficult times, that we can encourage each other, we can help correct each other. But many people, because of pride, they'll miss out on that blessing. Start relying on the Savior. Let me I'll read this poem and I'll, and I'll be done. It's a poem that you're probably familiar with called Invictus. It says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds me and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments to scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. There's only one problem with that. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. Are you with me? It's not true. It's, it's beautifully written. It's inspiring. But it's not true. You're not the captain of your fate. You're not the captain of your soul. You know who is? God. Jesus. He's the one who rules the hearts of men. He even rules the hearts of men that don't believe him. You're not the captain of your fate. Christ rules. So you can join him or you can rebel. Either way, Christ rules. Here's a poem that God has given an answer to that. A poem that we're all familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what, church? Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and what? He will direct your paths. And that's true. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, your own abilities, your own thinking, your own instincts. Trust in the Lord in all your ways. Acknowledge Him. Give Him glory, the glory that is due. And He'll direct your paths. He'll make your path straight. He'll point you in the right direction. And He'll empower you to do so. As we move into the invitation time today, this is the challenge of God's Word. 
See, brothers and sisters, we can rely on self or we can rely on the Savior. And there's no in-between. Jesus says, I would rather you be hot and walk in full obedience or I would rather you walk in disobedience and not claim my name than walk in the middle somewhere. He said, it makes me sick. <laughs> Those are hard words. You can rely on yourself or you can rely on the Savior. There's no in between. It can be hard to trust. I'll be the first to admit it. It's hard to trust, Lord, with the outcomes of our hopes, of our fears, of our plans. It's hard to trust Him with that. But God says, trust me with all your heart. Says, trust me with your life on earth. Trust me with your family on earth. Trust me with your career on earth. Just trust me in all ways. It says, also trust me with your soul for eternity. Friend, the greatest harm of self-reliance is this, is that a person can reject the Savior. The Bible says that Jesus came, that he died on the cross for you and for me. Even though we were sinful, we were stand guilty before a holy God, that Jesus came, he took all the wrath, all the punishment of God that we deserve for our sin, and he took it upon himself. And by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can become a Christian today. You can stop relying on yourself as your own Savior, trying to earn your way to God, which you cannot do according to Scripture. Or you can trust in a Savior who's paid it all, who's done all the work for you. Those are the only options on the table. And brother and sister, please don't leave here today unsure of where you'll spend eternity. Have you trusted Christ? Are you relying on yourself for salvation? Praise God that He is wholly reliable. He's wholly trustworthy. He's wholly good. Maybe in this invitation time, you just want to offer up praise to our God who is good and who is worthy. We need to be reminded of that as believers. Just make a commitment in your heart today. Say, God, I, I, I recommit my heart to rely on you. Not for this week, not for this month, but today I, re I rely, I, I recommit to you. And then tomorrow I rely on you again, and then so on and so forth. Begin that process now, depending on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Savior who's good in every way, who provides for us, who protects us, who leads us, who disciplines us. God, we thank you for a Savior. Lord, forgive us when we rely on ourselves, on our own wisdom, on our own strength, our own understanding. God, forgive us. Help us to rely on you. Lord, help us to be a church that doesn't rely on our, our programs, our buildings, our personalities, Lord, but we rely on you. Lord, for those who don't know you, they're working in their own strength to try to save themselves. They're trying to make themselves righteous before you. I pray they'd realize the error of their ways, God, and they would turn to you. They would trust you as their Savior today. Father, we love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.